I did say never again on Helgen Steam Locos, but today I have decided to give them one very final chance. Hello there everybody, Sam Strains here, welcome back to The Railway and welcome to another review. Now if you've been following my new series, the previous episode is linked up there if you haven't, you will know that Helgen have just released a brand new batch of Garrett locomotives and I think I must have had a funny turn or I must be losing it or something because I've bought one. Here it is, the largest locomotive I have ever reviewed. Now, I've been umming and ahhing a long time over whether or not to get one because obviously the last Helgen steamer I reviewed was an absolute disaster. You guys have persuaded me to do it. Most people said yes, they would like me to review one in the poll, so I've gone and done it. Now, obviously, as the largest steam loco I've ever reviewed, the price is going to be way up there, and that is certainly not untrue. The ROP is £249. I should have warned you to sit down before I said that, shouldn't I? An incredible amount of money. And the retailers are selling these for £212. So, needless to say, that's an incredible amount of money. I have actually bought this, this has not been lent to me as a review sample as some people suggested I should ask to do. I've actually paid all that money and actually got it here. So, without wanting to mince my words, if this is anything less than perfect, I'm going to be sending this back. If I find problems with it, I'm not going to be messing around. So if you're interested in these, if you, I guess, willing to take a risk like I have done, or if you just want to see which other ones are available, I do have an affiliate link down in the description so that you can check them out. For now though, I'm kind of nervous, but let's get this out and find out just what this is like. So fascination got the better of me with this one. I just couldn't resist, to be honest with you. I've got so many questions about the models. What are they like? How do they work? All of these things I just was desperate to know. So as you can see, well, just look at the size of the box. Absolutely gigantic box. It was a bit of a shock when this was delivered, I can tell you. And as you can see through the window, it's a very interesting grey colour. I believe this is known as the Works Photographic Grey. As far as I understand it, they were painted that colour so that they looked better in photographs. And I thought, well, I'm going to be photographing this one for a review, right? So why, not, why don't I get that version as well? So that's the reason behind that. If I show you the end of the box, you can see exactly exactly what this one is. So this is 266222 BG, which I'm hoping stands for Bayer Garrett and not Big Gaff, fingers crossed not. LMS number 4986 and it is in pristine, which I think means that Helgen do some weathered versions of this as well. Um, not 100% sure, I just went for this one because I'd, I'd thought about it actually, almost subconsciously. So I don't think there's an awful lot else to see on the box, which means that the terrifying moment of actually opening this is getting closer. So let's do it, shall we? Let's find out what this is like. I've not had it out of the box yet. It only arrived yesterday, in fact, so it's certainly uh, not been too long to wait. Look at the size of that. Like I say, so many questions. First question, is it a tender engine or a tank engine, or is it something entirely different? Yeah, crazy. I think these must be the water tanks. We'll talk about this more as it's come out. But I was thinking, if those are indeed the water tanks over the driven wheels, does that mean if the water runs low, the pulling power is diminished? Right, so here we go then. We have a booklet here. It says on the front, History of the Bayer Garrett. I'll try and get that into shot so that you can read it if you'd like to. Let's take a look inside. Right, Garrett information. This should be interesting. So this says that the thing runs on two five-pole motors, which effectively means you've got two locomotives in one here. It also says that this will run on 438 millimeter curves. I don't know what that is. Is that third or second radius? I'm hoping it's second, <laughs> otherwise I will be in trouble. And it's made up of three sections, which is very interesting. It shows you here how to separate the various sections it looks like. Um, DCC fitting, fortunately I won't have to do that, but uh, if you decide you're going to, then that's what you'd need to do. Oh, there's some notes as well, that's quite nice, isn't it? And what's on the back page? Oh, maintenance, well that is obviously something I'll need to do at some point, but fortunately not today. Oh, and there we are, there's a few of the different versions you can get. Uh, yeah, I do think the grey looks pretty striking, doesn't it? Uh, we'll see how easy it is to photograph, that will be interesting. Right, let's do this. Let's get to it. So, I think this just opens like normal packaging does, although I don't think I've ever had one this large before. Whoa, it's a tight fit. Ah. 
All right, okay, <laughs> incredibly tight fit, I should say. Right, what have we got inside here? Well, there's a detail bag, and inside are some fireman's tools. I can see a shovel, or a couple of shovels, and some NEM couplings. So presumably they're not already fitted to the model, unless they're spares. No, I can't see any on the model. So there we go. Yep, that's all pretty good, isn't it? Uh, not an awful lot in there, so not a lot of work to do for yourself if you decide to get one. Right, let's do it. Let's open the great packaging. And I seem to have forgotten how to open the Helgen packaging. Right, we have to undo the sides, it looks like. Man, they need instructions to show you how to open the box, don't they? Right. It is secure, I'll give them that. It needs to be. Okay, it's free. Let's take away the plastic cover. And there it is, the Garrett. Right, how do I lift this thing? That's the first big question. Whoa. Okay, this is scary, and it's come apart. <laughs> okay, right, okay, interesting. Um, that's a bit frightening. Okay, uh, I think we've got it. Right, so the moving parts are not actually connected, it seems. There's magnets that I can see which hold them on, uh, which is frightening because <laughs> I didn't realise it would actually come apart that easily. Uh, I probably should have read the instructions in a bit more detail, I guess, but either way, yeah, it's back together again now. Wow, this thing is extremely unusual. And yes, it does indeed look as though these are water tanks over the uh, driving wheels, and it weighs an awful lot. I'll have to weigh this for you so that I can tell you exactly how much it weighs, but it's certainly heavy. I'll give you that straight away. But I will take a closer look and find out for sure. But this is frightening but also quite exciting. I'm looking forward to this. I do believe this was Helgen's first ever model that they produced for the UK, uh, which I just found out for the first time the other day. Uh, so we will see how it goes. Right, here's a bit of history then on the Bayer Garretts. The first LMS Garretts were ordered from Bayer Peacock and Company and they were built in 1927. The LMS decided to employ such huge locomotives, uh, their 260 plus 260s, due to the fact that they had previously double or even triple headed locomotives in order to shift those larger trains, which was quite uneconomical. Unbelievably though, the LMS insisted that their standard design of axle box were to be used on the design, which is insane because they didn't even work properly on the likes of the 4Fs, let alone anything 10 times the size of a 4F, and therefore they were a key weakness in the design of the Garretts, unfortunately. A total of 33 of these were built for heavy freight duties between 1927 and 1930, and they had relatively short working lives. In fact, by the end of 1955, withdrawal was already well underway, and the final example had been withdrawn and scrapped by 1958, very sadly with no survivors. Okay, so there is this absolute beast, barely in the shot, very, very difficult to frame this, but there it is. Now, right off the bat, to Helgen's credit, this has to be the most sturdy loco I've ever had from Helgen, at least where the actual detailing is concerned. It's all very, very rugged, which is fantastic, so thumbs up for that. On the other hand though, there are one or two design choices and one or two features that I cannot believe are right here in front of me on a loco that costs 250 quid RRP. First of all, I cannot believe that the three major components of this are held together by magnets. Now, even though I did as the instruction said and I lifted the thing out by the tanks, as soon as I tried to position it in front of the camera, one of them came off. And of course, then you're at the mercy of the thin wires that connect it all together. Now, I could understand that if the three parts needed to come apart on a regular basis for some reason, but they don't. It's actually detrimental to the model that these pieces should come apart. So why have they made it so easy? Now, when it comes to locos and tenders, I've always thought that if the wires are permanent, which often they are, then the drawbar should be permanent. Otherwise, you'll end up snagging them. And there's quite a funny phrase in the instructions where it sort of says, please don't take them apart unless you have to. Well, then make it a little more difficult to take them apart. Another thing I can't believe is these axles. Look at the state of those. I mean, it's 200 quid, guys. Come on, couldn't you have fixed that? Couldn't you have hidden those a little bit? Makes it look like one of my old Triang models. Another thing, only half of the wheels pick up. Half of the wheels, I mean that literally. There are 16 wheels on this model and only eight of them pick up. And look at the state of the pickups. It looks like one of your granddad's kit builds. It really does. 
these center driving wheels don't have any pickups on them whatsoever and look at the amount of play in that man that's sort of frightening isn't it oh i don't know it's just i mean it's not a problem i'm sure it will be fine but you know because i have spent over 200 pounds on this I'm going to take this one personally, I must say, because it's a crazy, crazy amount to spend, and I was expecting absolute perfection. So yeah, there's a few really shoddy things. Mechanically, I'm dreading getting this running, because yeah, looking at the underside there, it's just such a far cry from the nice, tidy setups that you get from Hornby, even Backman, and every other manufacturer. Yeah, it just looks a little bit dodgy, doesn't it? And there's no room for dodginess when it comes to 200 quid. But on the positive side, as I say, it's an incredibly sturdy model, besides the fact that it all drops to pieces if you, you know, put too much weight on one part because it's held together by magnets. Can't believe that. But besides that, yeah, it's pretty good. It actually completely alters everything I thought I knew about British steam locomotives, whereby you've got a boiler and driving wheels underneath the boiler and then possibly another vehicle behind to carry the resources such as water and coal. Well, yeah, forget all of that with this, because we have got a boiler and a firebox. It's floating in midair, nothing underneath it whatsoever. You've got the driving wheels, which are completely separate, two completely separate sets of driving wheels at either end. And then you've got uh, presumably coal on this end, I would guess, and water on the other end. It's just totally unlike anything I've ever seen before, and I love it for that. The detail's pretty good then, so let's take a look at the painted detail. And I must say, I didn't know that Helgen could do this with Steam Locos. After the Tango, I had no confidence whatsoever in them. But as you can see, the application here is absolutely fine. You can look as closely at that as you like, and there's no problems whatsoever. Perfect application. Same with the LMS on the side of the cab there. It looks absolutely fantastic. Get this, all of the handrails appear to be fitted on the side of the boiler there, on the front of the smoke box, the biggest smoke box I've ever, ever seen, it must be said. All over the sort of tender, <laughs> I want to call it a tender, the tanks, I guess. Yeah, they're all separately fitted, which is exactly what you'd expect for a model of this price. And they're all intact, they're all perfectly applied. Take a look, I can show you the whole length of the thing and there are no glue marks. It's all just sort of pristine, as it said it was on the box. Now, I did notice there was quite a lot of moisture all over the thing. I don't know whether it was moisture or oil. Possibly it's been over lubricated, but just a little sort of smudge with the finger and it disappears. So luckily those are not permanent. So let's take a look. Well, look, there's this little plate on the side of the smoke box. I'm just going to show that really because I want a close up of it so that I can see what it says. Absolutely tiny is that, but it appears to be legible. On top of the boiler, let's start on the boiler and work out, shall we? You can see we do have safety valves here, which do appear to be plastic. And again, come on, guys, this is 250 quid. Those could easily have been made of metal and had a realistic metallic effect to them. Same thing goes for the whistles, although, of course, those are harder to produce, I know, in metal. So fair enough that those are not... I think the running plate, for want of a better term, of the boiler also appears to be die cast, so that's this along here. Very, very heavy and made of metal, so that's pretty good. That gives the model a lot of its weight. And as you can see, the underframe looks pretty good as well. There's quite a lot of pipes there. I just can't get used to seeing a boiler without anything underneath it. It's crazy, isn't it? Really crazy. You can, however, see some of the wires which connect the two sort of driving wheel sets. That's a little bit nasty. I wonder whether they ought to have found a way to tidy those up a little bit. But besides that, yeah, it's presented pretty well. There is this sort of large join underneath the boiler on both sides, which is quite noticeable. That's not really that acceptable either, is it? But I suppose on the grand scheme of things, it's not a huge complaint. Well, the cab is mounted to the firebox in the usual sense, and I'm, I'm assuming this has something to do with feeding coal into the cab there so that the fireman can shovel into the fire. As you can see, we have beautifully glazed windows, which actually make it difficult to see inside the cab, but I will try and get a shot of inside for you because as you can see, there is a level of painted detail inside there, which is pretty good to see. Let's take a look at the right-hand piece then, which is the end which contains the coal. First things first, the valve gear, the coupling rods, connecting rods. Look at this. This is how they are supposed to look. That Tango's connecting rods and such looked absolutely awful. These, though, have got a really high shine to them, which looks fantastic. 
Um, yeah, love that. And there's even tiny little painted details on the valve gear as well. Bits of it have been picked out in the gold paint. These cylinders also have what I'm assuming are drain cocks. They look a bit different to the drain cocks that I've seen before, so possibly they're not. You guys will have to let me know. But again, they're nicely painted. And there are so many separately fitted parts on the underframe. You've got the sanding pipes, which the instructions claimed I would have to fit, but sure enough, they are pre-fitted onto the model, which looks pretty good. Up on top, you can see there's just some incredible molded detail on the, uh, I don't know what this is, it's some, it must be some sort of either mechanical or not uh, feeding system for the coal. It looks very unusual, I'll have to do some research and find out exactly what that is, but it looks very interesting and I'd like to know more about that. There's plenty of fittings up on top which look interesting, not 100% sure what those would be for. That one on the back looks like it's something to do with water, but I don't think so. I think the water is stored on the left, although I could be wrong. Around the back, take a look at this. We've got more handrails. There is lamp irons which are pre-fitted and also a separately fitted lamp and you've got one of those on both ends which is pretty good. The buffer beams look impressive as well because there's real chain, well it's not an actual chain obviously but it's a proper metal little chain which has been pre-fitted, I like the look of that. We do have metal buffers but they're not sprung, I mean come on, 250 quid guys, sprung buffers isn't that difficult to achieve is it? You can buy a set for a couple of quid on eBay and then you've got these little steps which again have got a metal component to them which is really good, they do sort of bend outwards slightly but uh, they all do so I'm guessing that's not a design fault. <laughs> Yeah, looks really great, does that. The left portion with the water tank on top appears to be largely similar, at least in terms of the wheel set and the valve gear arrangement and all of that. Obviously, though, the water tank looks a little bit different. Again, just the level of detail on that looks really quite good. I'm not sure how old the, the actual uh, Garrett's are from Helgen, but it looks decent, doesn't it? It really does look the part. Um, but apart from the tank, it is basically the same on the back end. You've got that lamp as well pre-fitted and the steps and the unsprung buffers. So, yeah, there's quite a lot going on. Is it worth £200 at the moment, or 250 as is the RRP? I can't say so. I think 150 would have been really good for this. But yeah, once we're over the 200 quid threshold, I'm starting to wonder why it would need to be so expensive. However, it's nowhere near as bad as I thought it might have been from Helgen. I'm actually reasonably impressed. Yeah, true, the axles look a little bit awful, and there are some frankly bizarre design choices with the three parts being held together by magnets. Why those couldn't have just been screwed together, I have no idea whatsoever. But besides that, overall, very, very pleasantly surprised. However, now we've got the part that I'm not looking forward to, and that is performance. How is this thing going to run? Is it going to run at all? Is it going to break down after half an hour? The last batch of Helgen Garrett's have quite a bad reputation. You wouldn't believe the number of people that have sent me messages saying, mine's broken, or mine did break and I got rid of it. Yes, uh, not reliable things from what I've heard. So I'm hoping this is going to be much, much better. Right, let's give it a try, see how it goes. All right, so there it is, the Helgen Bayer Garrett down onto the track. And I must say, doesn't it look astonishing? I've just been filming some of the close-ups on it. And while it does have a few features that baffle and annoy me very slightly, it must be said there's an awful lot of, there must be an awful lot of assembly that goes into these things. And I must say I'm surprised at how impressive it is to say that it's Helgen. And I must say I'm also starting to change my mind a bit on Helgen. I didn't know they were capable of such a piece really. However, I'm fully prepared to take that back in its entirety over the next few minutes if the performance does not sort of pass muster. So mechanically speaking, yes, as we've already seen, the pickups are not that great. Uh, they look a little bit on the messy side. They look a little bit tacked on. There don't appear to be any proper bearings on the wheel sets. Um, there's no screws or anything even on the underside. So, you know, the quality of the mechanism is a little bit questionable at the moment. Obviously, it's more than my life's worth to try and take this apart at the moment uh, before I've even tried it. So I'm not really going to get a good idea of what the mechanism is like. However, it does contain two five pole motors, which is a first for me. I've never had that before. How those are going to work, I'm not too sure. I hope that all of the pickups are common together so that we at least uh, get power to everything at the same time or no power at all. Uh, otherwise, that would be a bit of a concern. I suppose I could find that out by lifting up one half and seeing if the other half goes. But we won't do any messing about to start with. I think we will just give it a little try 
and see if the thing actually works. Now 438 millimeters is indeed second radius curves. I don't have anything smaller than second radius on this layout. So hopefully, and if the instructions were right, and sometimes they're not, or at least with DAPL, then it shouldn't be a problem, but we will see. Let's set this to forwards then, and yes, I am incredibly nervous, hence my tendency to babble on at points like this, but let's just, fingers crossed, and do it. Okay, turning up the power. I saw a twitch, I can hear a bit of buzzing, and it's going. Ooh. You know what, the mechanism might, for all I know, be absolute pants, <laughs> but it sounds beautifully quiet. That is extremely quiet, to say there's effectively two engines there anyway. That's a beautiful mechanism. If you just played me the audio of that, I would say that sounds fine. I can hear something catching, I don't know if that's... Yeah, when it goes over that point there's a bit of a noise. I don't think that's anything to do with the mechanism though. No, it's that sanding pipe just there, or whatever it is. Um, yeah, I might need to bend that out of the way then. Let's have a little look. Oh yeah, that's a bit on the wonk, isn't it, that? Well, that might now be out of the way. Oh dear. <laughs> that's not a huge problem though. To be honest, I'll snip it off if it's being a pest. Yeah, that's not touching now, but... Who's to say it won't uh, touch again later on? So it's charged up and down a few times. Let's put it at half speed. Ooh, it's got that sort of low end rumble, which I quite like. Okay, so it hasn't been running yet. I must say that until it's been around the track, uh, I won't be able to pass any final judgment on the performance. But what sort of crawl can it do? Let's find out. That's that's about it at the moment. Ideally, that will Im oh no oh no it's taken off now. Ideally, that will improve greatly once this gets running. Oh, interesting. Let's try and slow it down. It has a job getting started, but then it goes. Yeah, that that really is as slow as it can go at the moment. It appears, looking at the photos in the instructions, to have a very similar motor to the Helgen Tango, which is looks like a cordless type. I don't know whether it is, but uh, yeah, it's like a round cylinder. Uh, I don't know why I'm telling. You, don't know why I'm describing the motor. Right, let me lift up this end very, very carefully. This is very precarious. Oh. Oh, no, that's okay, yeah. So both ends are common together, that's fine. It confused me because the end I lifted up was running and the, the end that I hadn't lifted up wasn't, but it just doesn't have the torque to push itself forward while I'm holding it. Well, I'll set the camera up on a curve <laughs> and we'll see how it performs on a curve. Ooh, frightening stuff. Right, start the engines, 50% speed, let running in commence. Please cross your fingers. Here we go. It's coming, it's approaching. Taking the curve now. Okay. Ah, okay. Damn, I dared to get too hopeful. Let's try that again. Yeah, I thought that might be a bit too good to be true, to be honest with you. Let's go again. This is only a second radius curve. It has been known to upset locos before though, so I'm not that surprised. Right, let me just pull it over by hand. So this S-bend might well cause problems. Oh no, that's not so bad. Yeah, it, it wasn't binding up there, so let's just try that again a bit more slowly, perhaps. Because don't forget, these are not rocket engines. This is a particularly nasty bit of track, because you've got a sort of right curve, followed by a straight, and then an immediate left curve but the engine's so big that it's on both, well, all three elements at once. Might have just been bad luck. Mmm, confidence coming back. Right, let's try it again at 50% speed. Might just have to keep it slow, or put it on the inside line where I've not got any tricky track elements. But this is a good element of the test, you know, if I just run it round a fourth radius circuit, that wouldn't really be a good test. 
Ah, there we go. Man, Helgen have done it. They have created a model locomotive, a steam locomotive, that I can honestly say that I really like. So we're at speed 40 now. Is it any better? I'm watching this front end. Ooh, that wasn't happy, <laughs> but it managed it just about. And guess what, folks? The lamps actually work. You know those tiny lamps? Look. It really is working. So I'm going to leave this to run in. It's a difficult thing to film. It's so long. And then we'll come back and try it again. Right, be right back. Okay, we are back, and it's now had chance to do a really good run in. You'll notice it's now facing the other way because it did actually keep derailing on various second radius curves, and I just tried turning it around the other way, and it's actually not derailed since I did that. So yeah, perhaps it is a little bit sensitive to dodgy track work. I know a lot of people are going to say it's entirely your fault for having track on carpet, blah, blah, blah. But if you think about it, that argument doesn't really make sense because I've got close to 400 other locos that all work perfectly on the track, as you see every time I upload a video. So when a loco comes along that can't manage it, it's not entirely down to the fact that the track is on the floor. You can't realistically come to that conclusion. I will say it's a factor, but this is a hobby. Not everybody is going to have professionally laid track. And I guess my layout really is the perfect test for locos like that. However, if your track is better than mine, which is not hard to do, I don't think you will have any issues. So let's talk about what's been going on then. So I've weighed it. It weighs in at 723 grams, which is the heaviest loco I think I've ever weighed. The Hatton's Class 66 was the last heaviest at 700. This is a little bit heavier. The pulling force isn't quite that good though. I've only measured 0 0.8 newtons, which is still an incredible amount, many times more powerful than other steamers I've got. Uh, and you can still get close to 50 50 coaches with that I calculate so yeah it's pretty powerful but the big question is now that it's run in and it's had a really good I would say hour now running in um, is it able to do a better crawl well let's find out here we go I'm going to really turn it up slowly this time to try and get the best out of it here we go we are it's going backwards or forwards technically I did see it twitch. I'm still turning it up just a fraction at a time, really small amount. There we go. Oop. It started and now it stopped again. So let's give it a little more. Oh. Ah. So that's what happens. You just get to the point where it starts to move and then it picks up a bit of momentum and starts. So really, you see, it can't manage that speed. Keep going that is about the slowest it can go, which is a shame. So I can certify that these cannot crawl, at least not on my uh, Gage Master controller. Maybe it would do better on the HM2000. That might be worth a test. Uh, go on then, let's try it. Okay, so now I'm hooked up to the HM2000, which is a feedback controller. Whether this will affect the performance in any way, well, let's find out. So let's give it a little juice, see if this is any better. Hmm. Well, it, it is actually, yes. I wouldn't say it's a good crawl, and as much as I like this, I have to be honest with you and say the crawl isn't that great, and perhaps a proper set of bearings and a bit better mechanism might have done favours for this. Yeah, I, mean, it's, I wouldn't say it's a good crawl. It is better on a feedback controller, so if you've got the choice between feedback and not, I would say feedback is the way to go with it. And how it runs on DCC, I've no idea. Probably quite similar to the Gauge Master, actually, because I don't think decoders use feedback, do they? Well, they wouldn't need to, would they, really? Come on, one more. Mm. Yeah, it, the first one I did with it was best, actually. It's not so good now. Right, let me put it back onto the outside line, and I'll show you what I'm going to run it with. So I've set up a whole load of wagons. As you can see, there's about 30 there, so quite a lot. My secret formula ooh, suggests that this should be able to manage about 45 coaches on straight and level track. So I'm fairly confident that it should be able to manage about 30 wagons on not straight and level track. So let's go for the coupling, see what happens. Let's find out whether Helgen have managed to perfect the coupling. Is it drooping or is it going to work? Let's find out. 
I really love how nice and quietly it goes. Right, whoa, <laughs> crunch, are we there? Right, let's send it back into the other direction and find out. Here we go, no. <laughs> Try again and then we'll have a look, see what's happening. Right, we'll go for it one more time. Uh, yeah, the coupling was too far to the left. It's actually really quite uh, rigid there. Um, I don't know whether that chain that I talked about that is getting in the way or not. Feels like there's quite a lot of resistance there, actually. Could have been part of the reason why it was derailing. Right, one more go. <laughs> Right, that sounded a bit better. Yes, it was. Right, 30-odd wagons haven't been bothered to count, so it might be a bit off. Let's see if she can do it. There we go. Well, yeah, without any problems, actually. That ain't bad. So, on the middle line, I've opted for another massive steamer. Admittedly, not quite as large as the uh, Garrett, but still pretty large. If I can get the direction right, here it comes now. It is the Daylight, um, Southern Pacific Daylight, is that right? Something like that. There it goes anyway. Looking really good. That's a Backman one. And then on the inside line, just to show us how things have changed, we have, here it comes, are you ready? The Helgen Tango. A far, far inferior loco to the Garrett. You wouldn't even guess they were from the same manufacturer, really. Still working after it's swim in the pool, as you can see. Check this video out in the top right if you want to see that one. But yeah, the Garrett is leaps and bounds better. Not 100% better, it's still got a couple of minor issues, but at least it looks good and it works. And I never expected to say that about any Helgen Loco, so yes, thoroughly impressed with that. Right, let's watch it. Let's see how it goes up the hill. Oh, just look at it. Doesn't it look astonishingly good? One of my best looking engines, I would say. But blimey, it does slow down. It seems to really affect it, doesn't it? So yeah, whether torque's an issue, whether it's just because it's drawing a lot more current for the two motors and so the voltage drop is greater, I don't know. But yeah, it did, it did slow down quite a lot. And in fact, if I slow it down much more on the controller, it almost comes to a stop just there. In fact, I'll show you that because people will say I'm making that up. <laughs> so here we are at a bit more of a freight speed, a bit slower. And I'm just going to demonstrate to you what I mean. So I'm going to do it all in one take so that nobody says I've touched the controller. And let me try and follow it. Sorry for the dodgy camera work. And you will see how it affects it. So this, in theory, wouldn't be as bad with a feedback controller. <laughs> as you can see, those second radius curves really zapped it. And it'll probably happen with the curve at the top of the hill again. Let's see. So do bear in mind, if you've got a big layout and you're running on DC, you might find it slowing down a lot more than other engines do. I just can't get over how cool it looks. And I can't get over how much I like it. I was not expecting to, I know I keep saying so, but I'm just amazed that I actually paid all that money and got a decent loco, and it really is good, I love it. I'm definitely gonna keep it, that's for sure. Yeah, look at it, amazing. But of course, before you rush out and buy one, I must reiterate that the crawl is pants and the mechanism definitely leaves quite a bit to be desired. However, all of those reliability issues that these are well known for do seem to have disappeared with this latest batch, if my example is anything to go by. But yeah, do bear in mind the pros and cons. Overall though, it does seem to tick all of the boxes. It is fit for purpose. So here are some of my ratings then for the Helgen Garrett, and it must be said that I am pleasantly surprised by this. I never expected it to be as decent as this. So detail, I've given it a good solid four out of five. There are some amazing details on this. The working lamps are astonishing, I love that. And little tiny things like real chains on the buffer beams really make a great difference. 
However, there are one or two things that let it down very slightly that mean I can't give it five stars. No sprung buffers, visible wires underneath the boiler, for example, and also those axles on the wheels look really toy-like. Besides that, though, it's not bad at all. Performance, I've given it three stars. The performance generally is really good. It runs nice and quietly, which is great. However, it can't do a crawl and it does seem quite sensitive to sort of questionably laid track. I know that's not entirely the Loco's fault, but if all my other engines work fine on the layout and one doesn't, as always, that suggests a problem with the Loco. So it is sensitive. However, I have managed to get the thing to work okay now and it's not a problem. So three out of five there. Power though, incredibly powerful. Perhaps not as powerful as I'd expect. The Hatton 66 was a similar weight and could haul a lot more, but still 0.8 Newtons, 45 coaches is very, very good. The mechanism then I've given three stars, two 5.4 motors, I really do like that, but I wish it had some more pickups. There's no reason why those center driven wheels couldn't have pickups on them. And also the fact that there are no proper bearings and that in fact, looking underneath there, it doesn't look the best, does it? I don't know why they couldn't just use screws to allow better servicing access. And like I say, no bearings means that I can't give it any more really than a three out of five there. The quality I've given three and a half out of five. It's too harsh, I think, just to give it three, but I don't think the model deserves as much as a four. So I don't like the fact that the three main parts are held together with magnets. Something seems just wrong about that. There's no reason why they couldn't be screwed together. And in fact, that is a grievance I've had with lots of Helgen Locos. Why don't they just use screws? It's just so much better. It makes handling them so much easier. And also, of course, yes, the mechanism is not that great a quality. For 250 quid, there's no room for no proper bearings, and there's no room for that amount of movement on the wheel set, unfortunately. But yeah, the quality is pretty good, I would say. Now, value then, for 249 pounds, I was gonna say that this is terrible value for money. And I paid 212 pounds for this from Hattons, which is still an awful lot of money. Now, it's a lot better than I expected. The level of detail is pretty good. The performance is really good. However, it needed to have been perfect to have gotten a five out of five. However, it's not terrible, so four stars there. Overall then, that is 7.45 out of 10, a very decent score. Into the logbook it goes then. There we go, third, just above the Backman 43XX and below the Ruston Shunter. Worlds better than I expected, and I can actually recommend them. Get that, crazy times. So as a reviewer, I say this is okay, but as an enthusiast, I say this is great. Is it worth £212? Well, that's what I'm not sure about. Clearly, there's an awful lot of assembly that goes on. There's loads and loads of separately fitted parts. And when you think that some of Hornby's latest announced Pacifics are going to be costing like 160 odd, 170 odd quid from the retailers, maybe the size of this means that it's not too bad. However, it's not 100% perfect, is it? So you guys will have to let me know, is this worth £212? And let me know in the comments, what would you pay for this? What would the price need to be in order for you to buy one? And let me know what you think in the comments too, in general. Very, very interesting model. So that was one heck of an experience to review that. Thoroughly enjoyed looking at that. Very much unlike anything else I've ever looked at before. And to Helgen, well done for getting it right. On the whole, for getting it right. I'm not sorry for some of the things I've said in the past. A lot of them still stand. However, this has changed my opinion on Helgen very slightly. I now will no longer say that Helgen are not capable of producing a decent steam locomotive because, yeah, this is the antithesis to that, really. It is decent, overall, very decent, and I enjoyed it. And I hope you did as well, folks. Thank you very much for joining me. As I say, let me know in the comments your thoughts, and I will see you on the next one. All right, folks, have a great week. See you all very, very soon.